Uh, you can text 87222, start your message with the word talk. Now, England's Deputy Chief Medical Officer, has we, as we've been talking about, has called for the nation's 10pm pub curfew to be brought forward to 6pm in an effort to reduce the increasing rates of transmission. When asked by Greater Manchester MPs whether a 10pm curfew reduced the rates of coronavirus, Professor Jonathan Van Tam responded, not really, I'd prefer 6pm or even earlier. Wow. However, the government advisor also admitted there was no evidence that shutting pubs down completely under a tier three lockdown would control the virus. Has, virus. Has the world of science lost the plot? Professor Hugh Pennington, emeritus microbiologist at the University of Aberdeen, and previously told this programme that pubs are a dangerous place to be in relation to the spread of the coronavirus, is with us now. Hugh Pennington, good afternoon to you, sir. Um, I hate to say it to an eminent scientist, but you think has your world lost the plot, do you think, on this a little, sir? Oh, a wee bit, a wee bit. We've lost the plot in the UK a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the cases are going up, well, not everywhere, but in most places. And my my guess, uh, and I don't really have strong evidence in favour of it, I have evidence in favour of it, is that, you know, people are not, when they're supposed to be self-isolating, they're not. They're nipping out quickly, they're perhaps spreading the infection, certainly if they're positive, uh, you know, they have a virus positive test. And we know that the... Uh, basically, the um, the number of people who self isolate when they're supposed to is actually I don't know, it's sort of less than twenty percent. Well, that that's that drives a coach and horses through mm. the test and then trace system, and it really is one of the reasons, and it may be the main reason why the cases are not coming down as they should be, despite all the other controls sure. that we've got to close, like you know, like closing pubs in Liverpool and all that kind of thing. Why why has the humble pub got it in the neck so much? I mean you'd find more people in a shop on any given day than you would in a pub. You'd find more people on buses than pubs, more people on the tube than pubs. For some reason it's become the sort of go to bad guy of the piece here. Well, it's basically done on the history of how this virus has been behaving, and it has caused pub outbreaks all over the place. We had quite a big one in Aberdeen, and we closed the pub for, uh, for three weeks and had travel restrictions, and the outbreak was controlled. And they've had them in New Zealand, and they've had them in South Korea, and so on. And we have to run, basically, uh, our, our policies based on evidence. And the evidence is that pubs... Now, of course, you know, it's not just going to a pub that it gets uh, you know, somebody infected. There's got to be somebody else in there breathing out the virus. And they've got to be there for a reasonable length of time. And you've got to be there for a reasonable length of time. So it's not as simple as just saying, oh, pubs are dangerous. True. It's when somebody's going in there infected, spreading the virus, perhaps unknowingly, because they haven't got any symptoms. And uh, you staying there for a while social distancing after a bit of alcohol clearly is not as easy as True, it but is. It, but the, the figures that we're looking at here, Hugh, tell us that, you know, 75.3% of transmissions happen in homes, 5.5% in pubs. And again, I would suggest that buses or trains would be far greater areas or certainly far busier areas than pubs. And most pubs I've experienced, and I don't go into one every single day, seem to have been rather good at social distancing. I'm sure there's one or two tearaway venues out there that don't give a hoot. But um, generally speaking, they seem rather careful on this, far more than a bus or a train. Well, yes. I mean, I think, don't think the trains have been particularly busy and buses. You know, people have been avoiding public transport for good reason. Self-interest and that's, that's what they're being advised to do, work from home, all that kind of thing. And pubs are relaxation at the end of a hard day. You're going to the pub and so on. And I come back to what I said, that basically we know that the virus can get about very easily in pubs. And it's not just, you know, a handful of cases. It's a large number of cases being caused by one person going in there who's a super spreader infecting, you know, a large number of people in the pub. That's unlikely to happen on a bus. We know about uh, airplanes, very poor, in, in fact, for the virus to get about for all sorts of reasons. And it's probably the same on buses and on, on, on trains as well. And of course, if you're wearing a mask, that reduces the risk of catching the infection. And even more importantly, if you're wearing a mask and you've got the virus, it, it very significantly reduces the chance that you're going to infect anybody else. Well, I don't suppose people in pubs wear masks very often. But anyway, there sure. it is. But then we keep just another one of the reasons we were asking the question is whether the, whether the world of science has lost the plot was because of the, the, the kind of changing advice. I mean, the science said don't lock down too early. Now the science says lock down. The science said don't wear a mask. Now it says you must wear a mask. You're echoing that the, the, the latter point there. It sounds as if your profession, Hugh, is just 
throwing as much out there as it can without really knowing. This is best guess territory, right? Well, up to a point, as I said, we've got strong evidence that pubs can be places where the virus gets about very easily and causes large number of cases. And that's one of the reasons why pubs are focused on uh, in, in control measures. And clearly it's much easier to close a pub than to close somebody's home. And we know that the the average number of people living in a house is you know, 2.5 or something like that. Well, the average number of people in a pub is going to be a lot greater sure. than 2.5 even when you've got social restrictions. And but don't, don't we need some people to get this? Well, you know, there's, there's going to be an element of herd immunity, even if that isn't explicitly said by the uh, government. The problem with herd immunity is that you'd have to infect 60 or 70, or maybe 80% of the population before you'd get it, before that would have an effect on, on the level of virus. And at that point, a large number of people would have uh, succumbed because, you know, a significant proportion of the population is elderly and so on. Mm. And that was a uh, that herd immunity fell into disrepute because of the side effect. Well, it's not really a side effect. You know what I mean? Uh, of, of a large number of folk, elderly folk dying because the mortality rate in over 80s is, is, you know, is, is horrendous. But but those dying with COVID is is a year later than those dying naturally. We we're told. Well, yes, but yeah, you know, we can't. You know oh, that. Yes. We, that, argument there that we want to go down no i know but it, it's all of these arguments are uncomfortable aren't they and governments make these kind of uncomfortable trade-offs all the time whether they're talking about medicine whether they're talking about social based issues whether they're talking about the welfare system and you know the reality is that you could be talking about somebody who may uh, uh, be at the end of their life and they, they get covid as distinct from perhaps pneumonia which they would have got and that would have been the very last thing they got before they died uh, could be a difference of a you know three or four weeks in terms of their lifespan. It's not they were killed it, it by might, coronavirus. It might well be, but I think we have an obligation if we prevent something that's got a lethal effect, uh, we're, we're obliged to prevent it, even if we're only doing that kind of marginal thing. Um, but it's not really. I don't think the public would regard that as marginal because you don't really know how long those people would have lived okay. if they hadn't. Iris. All right, so there it is. Professor Hugh Pennington, it's always lovely to have you on, sir. Thank you, Emeritus Microbiologist at the University of Aberdeen. And I respect Hugh greatly. His brain is the size of a solar system. I'm not absolutely sure he was sure about whether the science was solid either. Did you pick that up too? Oh, three, four, 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 nine, nine, one thousand. Now let's.